Hello, our next speaker is Florian Opser, who will be talking about Unwind, a privileged separated validating DNS recursive name server for every laptop. You have the floor. Oh, thank you. thank you. Can you switch this over? Oh, yeah, I will. <coughs> Other people's laptops are the worst. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm going to talk about uh, Unwind. Uh, I'm Florian. I'm an OpenBSD developer since uh, 2012, where I mostly specialize on uh, privileged separated network demons. I've also poked at things in a network stack. And since of, uh, um, this week, my uh, total contributions on uh, OpenBSD have been a net negative. I deleted more lines than I added. And um, I'm not going to talk about this because that will give uh, Andre nightmares, I think. Um, for work, uh, I work as a senior systems uh, engineer at the RIPE NCC, where I'm a part of the team that runs the uh, K-root name server, which basically means uh, we have to figure out how to answer NX domain real fast. But, but, but uh, uh, more about the things that I do for fun. So OpenBSD has been described as a, as a hiking club with a computer problem. So when we get out, out of our basement, uh, we, we go on hackathons, we meet, meet up in all these uh, beautiful places, and so we need to travel there. And you might end up on a train or um, hotel Wi-Fi. You might be in, a, in an airport. And you're always stuck with what the network provides you DNS-wise. Uh, sometimes you find yourself behind a captive portal. And you need to get past that. And so we were thinking, can we automate this? You, you always fiddle with your configuration. Can, can we have a daemon running that handles this for you? that handles the, the, the harsh locations, uh, DNS-wise, network-wise. Uh, well, actually, no matter how harsh they are, maybe you find yourself in a hut in the Rocky Mountains in the snow behind the saddle, I think. And we have done this twice. It was awesome. So what did people do before on their laptop? Um, you just run DHclient. It takes over ResolveConf. Uh, you will get past captive portals with this, because that's how they are designed, how to get past them. <coughs> But you're at the mercy of the um, name server operator that whatever the network hands you. You don't have DNSSEC in the sense of you don't run the crypto on your laptop. So m maybe uh, the name server does this, but it gives you an AD flag. Can you trust that? I don't. Uh, it also probably doesn't give you privacy. Really depends on what the thing behind this does, but not on the first hop. And you're resolving runs in the same address space. So if I run ping fastm.org, um, this goes to libc, uh, um, uses the stop resolver there, and talks to something that I don't know who actually runs this. Can I trust this? It hands me back a network package, which I then need to parse. Um, a variation on this is, yeah, I really don't trust that network. Uh, I put one of the quad axes in there and resolve conf. This will very likely not get you past captive portals. And... Um, it also will not work in places where DNS is filtered. Um, then in OpenBSD, we do have unbound in base, so people figured, well, we can just run that, uh, which gives you then a DNSSEC validation. You can have privacy with DOT if you configure a line. <coughs> They'll very likely not get you past captive portals, and it will not work in, in places where DNS is filtered. However, it runs in a different address space. Um, there are some other options that you can do. Uh, for, uh, there was a talk, la a talk last year at FOSDAM about uh, systemd resolve D, which seems like they're, they're trying to solve the same problem that we are trying to do with, with Unwind. Uh, so that was certainly an interesting talk for, for ideas. Now, <coughs> what uh, does Unwind promise? Uh, again, we're taking over ResolveConf. Um, we, uh, we get DNSSEC validation. We get DOT if you configure it. Uh, it will get you past captive portals. It will work in places where uh, DNS is filtered, and it runs in a different address space. The, the architecture, uh, so we, we, all, we want to run this always, so we need to get this uh, uh, secure. Um, we're following the, the standard OpenMIS, the um, privilege separated daemon architecture, which mostly consists of uh, three processes. Um, we, we have this design in, in multiple daemons uh, already, and uh, using, using that template, uh, it gives us op uh, IPC over, over pipes with uh, structured data. We don't need to reparse it. It gives us um, a config file where the grammar is, is very similar across the daemon, so people are already familiar with the config language. Oh, yeah. And um, 
It, it also gives you a logging framework uh, where it logs the syslog, or if you run it in the foreground, it will automatically log the standard error, and the CLI tool. <coughs> Now, the, the, the three processes, uh, we have a parent process that just spins everything up. It's privileged. It opens uh, port 53 and hands that over to the, uh, the front-end process. Uh, it asks um, the edge client for, uh, oh, did you learn some, some uh, name servers? Please tell them to me. And we run the processes in a um, reduced service operating mode. We, we, with the syscall, we have an open BST. It's called pledge, and it's, it's literally just this string, which means uh, we plan to only uh, use the standard IO parts of libc, uh, talk to open file descriptors, uh, that's the standard IO plan. We, we plan to only open files for reading, and um, for technicality we can then send uh, file descriptors over a socket, uh, over a pipe, sorry. And if you do something else in that process, it just gets killed by the kernel. Um, Another, the, the, the second process uh, is the front-end process that gets the, the queries from a client, uh, which then uh, parses it and uh, hands over a, a, a structured data to the resolver process. <coughs> and when it, when it gets a re uh, response back from there, um, it sends that back to the client. This uh, part also handles the uh, control socket, and um, it, it, it gets informed by the kernel when an interface goes up, down, or an uh, interface just uh, uh, disappears, and uh, also the learned name servers uh, arrive here. So this is the process um, that's mostly export, uh, ex, uh, exposed to, uh, to the outside in the sense of where uh, user interaction comes in. <coughs> um, and the, the final process is where we do our, all our uh, heavy lifting uh, in, in for DNS. And this part needs to uh, keep track of various uh, resolving strategies. I'm going to talk later about what, what those are. Uh, it receives a query from the front-end process, finds the best strategy to get this resolved, and uh, when an answer comes back, it uh, passes this uh, back to the, to the front-end. And since this one does... Um, uh, um, do all the DNS resolving, eventually it needs to talk to the internet, uh, so it has the INET pledge in there, which basically means you're allowed to open a socket and talk to the internet, uh, but not a lot of more. Oh, there's one thing, since we do support a DOT, uh, we need a third bundle, but we don't want this process to read the whole file system, <coughs> so we can tell it with the, uh, the unmail service call, look, there's only this one file. Only this file exists in your um, whole file system. If you try to open something else, the kernel will tell you this does not exist. Uh, so you cannot uh, exfiltrate uh, any information that's on the file system. It's just not there. <sighs> Time for a breath. Um, let's talk about um, the, the resolving bit, because this is, uh, I suppose, the interesting part for, for this room. And so I mentioned that... Um, I run a name server for a living, which means I go to all the, the conferences and um, go to the, the, uh, the DNS talks. And what the implementers tell me is, oh boy, it's really terrible to implement a resolver. Don't do that. And no, I'm not doing that. Um, we're just standing on the shoulder of giants and, and use a lib unbound for that, uh, which is the, uh, the working horse for, for, for unbound. Um, and for, for technical reasons, we have a local copy in there um, because the API does not expose all the things that we need, so we need to poke at some internals. But th this is certainly not a fork. I do not want to maintain that. So every time there is a new release from uh, NLNet, I just want to jam that in. So I mentioned the uh, resolver strategies. This is where this uh, really gets interesting. So you can run Unwind without a config file, which already gives you four strategies. Uh, it can run as a recursor, basically what, what uh, Unmount would do. It can talk to uh, learned forwarders. It will try to talk opportunistic DOT to uh, learned forwarders. And uh, it can run as a... Um, it can sidestep lib unbound and just use the, the lib C stub. Um, we'll later see why that is important. Then you can also give it a config file where you configure a DOT forwards with an authentication name. For the, for the opportunistic DOT, uh, it cannot validate the cert, it doesn't know the name, but in the config file you can put in a name and it will then uh, validate the cert. 
Um, and in the config file, you can also tweak the, the, the preferences of the strategies, and uh, this is just uh, the default uh, that it uh, runs with. Um, all, the, all the strategies um, run off of individual libunbound contacts, so one of them can do uh, its own recursion, the other one can talk to a forwarder, but these are uh, different uh, uh, objects. And uh, we found a way to have a, a shared cache here. We need to be a bit careful there, uh, since uh, you can only share a cache if um, the, um, the context has the, 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 the same quality. Uh, it basically means it needs to be able to validate. Uh, if you try to uh, share a cache uh, between a strategy that does not valid, that cannot validate because uh, signatures are stripped, uh, if you jam that into the same cache, uh, real interesting things happen. And um, this is all single threaded. We plug it in together with a, a lib event. So we, we need to figure out are these strategies any good? And um, what, what we do for that is uh, we ask for the uh, start of authority, authority record for the root zone because we know that that exists and we know that it's signed. And from there we can deduce if uh, a specific uh, strategy is any good. So we can uh, find out is this strategy validating or um, does this strip uh, R6 or a DNS keys which happens on some middle boxes or happens on some, some uh, uh, open public resolvers? then we assign uh, um, this thing is resolving. Or maybe we just can't talk DNS to the outside world because 53 or 853 are blocked. Then uh, this strategy is clearly dead and we will not hand any uh, queries to it. Um, another thing that we're doing is we, we observe how, how good a strategy is, how, how fast does it uh, answer. So we, we keep track of the round trip time and uh, put, that, put that into a uh, decaying histogram and calculate a um, uh, median of the round trip time over that. And uh, so running the, the CLI tool um, on, on my laptop, it, it, I think it was online for about a week or so, um, and it shows me this. Um, so this is where we uh, calculate uh, uh, the, the quality from. And, um, I suppose one interesting thing is the first column where um, the, the round trip time is below 10 milliseconds and uh, all the queries ended up there, which basically means that these are all cache hits. Uh, so eventually everything gets answered after the cache, uh, except for all the other stuff, I guess. Um, so we, we have all these strategies. We, have, we, we checked out if they're any good. And um, how do we do the resolving now? Well. Uh, we need to sort the strategies to find the best one, and validating is always strictly better than resolving. And then we use the median RTT for a tiebreaker. And we also have the, um, the preference to consider. And the way we do that is we, we skew the, the most preferred strategy by 200 milliseconds. So if I say, I really want to do recursive resolving as the, the, the preferred strategy, uh, what I mean is, yeah, I'm willing to wait 200 milliseconds more. Um, but if I find myself behind a satellite link, what that usually means if I try to do my own recursive resolving and an answer comes in uh, two seconds after I ask. I'm not willing to wait that long. So yeah, you can wait 200 milliseconds more, but yeah, then uh, just give up there. So what we're doing is we pick up the best strategy, um, give it to Libanman to do the resolving and start a timer, which waits the um, measured round trip time milliseconds. And if we do not get an answer, we try the next best strategy, and if we and wait the round trip time milliseconds, and um, and so on and so on. Well, if we do not cancel the already running queries, uh, because we put on all the work already there, they are talking to the internet. Uh, things are happening. Uh, we might as well, uh, while we do all the work already, um, maybe get a hot cache here. And uh, we also want to know how terrible is this actually. This will skew uh, the round trip time in the histogram, so on the next time we will not actually uh, use this strategy because we already know that it's bad. Um, and this is how this kind of all started. So uh, captive portals and, and DNS breakage. The uh, captive portals break DNS, so it's kind of the same category. Um, we used to have what, what, what your phone is doing and uh, what the, the Jesus laptop here is doing and what browsers are doing is that they have an HTTP check. They just go off to the internet and do an HTTP query to a well-known URL where they get a well-known answer. And if they don't get that answer, 
um, they assume they're behind the captive portal, where you then need to click here, yeah, accept the terms and conditions, and all this, yada, yada, yada. Um, so uh, Chrome has a URL for this, or Android has a URL for this, uh, Mozilla has one, Apple has one. We, we have a CDN, we could run our own. But we could never agree on which evil corp we should trust here. And why are we trust where they live? So one night we were, we were talking, so we, we monitor DNS. Uh, we, we know a thing about DNS. Can we do this inline, just toss the HTTP? And turns out we can. Uh, we just need to have a look on how broken are things, actually. So you find yourself behind a captive portal. You need to agree to the terms and conditions. And what the thing does, it, it completely blocks you off from the internet. You can only talk to the DHCP forwarders. Well, fine, talk to those, uh, and you're done. Um, th this is simple. Um, then you find yourself on the Dutch railway. And they are special. So they have an open Wi-Fi. Uh, you connect to the thing. And whenever you, you, you send a query with, uh, um, that has an EDNS0 option, they just answer NX domain to everything. This also turns out it's, it's kind of okay -ish because, well, we do the, the, the check, uh, ca does this strategy actually work, and we ask for the root zone, and that, this thing says, yeah, the root zone, that does not exist. Which is a cute story, but kind of, I don't trust that one. Uh, so everything uh, will have the quality of uh, uh, that will not be used, and this is where, uh, why we have the stop in there as well, because the, the libc stop does not do the DNS, so you, you can actually get through that thing. So you can click the, the terms and condition, and everything is fine. Everything is shiny. And um, so I actually have then a DOT configured, which then uh, upgrades all of this to DOT. Because even if you are uh, behind the camp of portal, if you, if you went through there, uh, it will still answer annex domain. It will intercept your DNS. Um, now, then maybe you, you're living in the Netherlands and you want to fly somewhere. Oh, no, hang on. That's the next one. Um, sorry. You find yourself in, in situations where DNS is actually open. And these are getting a mo bit more difficult because all your strategies suddenly say, yeah, this is totally working. The root don't exist. I can resolve this. Uh, now you can, of course, uh, run IP over DNS, but that's not particularly fast. Um, the, the problem here is, so you, you get an HTTP redirect, the, the, the captive portal, the middle box intercepts uh, your HTTP or HTTPS um, and redirects you to a thing which runs on the middle box. And, but it's not, the, the, the redirect is not resolvable on the public internet. So the resolver says, yeah, um, Annex domain. You talk to one of the quad axes, it says annex domain. Uh, you, you talk DOT uh, to one of the public ones, it says annex domain. It's not resolvable. So we came up with a heuristic where we're saying, okay, fine. Uh, for the first five minutes, um, we do not trust annex domain. Uh, we, we just, if you get an annex domain, we just go to the stop and, and figure it out that way, uh, which works uh, real well. And uh, yeah, we, we go directly to the stop, not to the forwarders, to do just sidestep the DNS zero issue at this point. Um, now I'm at an airport uh, in Amsterdam. This is brilliant. So you get a redirect, and or you you you, you go to the internet, you talk HTTP, you get a redirect to uh, the, the captive portal, and uh, this one is DNS signed, uh, which works out uh, quite nicely. And uh, so then you click, yeah, I agree to the terms and conditions, and then it uh, forwards you to another page where it actually opens up the internet. That one is also resolvable on the public internet, uh, but the validation fails. There are just no RR6 on this. And uh, so, um, yeah, another heuristic there. Uh, we do not trust validation errors for the first five minutes. Um, so, but in, in uh, so, so people, so I, I traveled with this. Uh, um, a lot of developers uh, use this for, for their traveling, and uh, it gets them past things. Uh, there's still some, uh, there's still some stuff that uh, that we need to work on. Um, 
So when, when uh, our laptops have uh, maybe 4G cards, and they also hand us forwarders, uh, but we need to figure out, so we, and we just jam them in with, with all the other forwarders, but this is not correct. Uh, you should only use them when, you, when you're actually uh, on 4G and not Wi-Fi. Um, in, in practice, this actually works out because they are not reachable when you're on Wi-Fi, but it's still wrong. Mm, a, a much bigger problem is what are we actually doing about DNSSEC? So you can say, well, uh, be, be strict about this. DNSSEC is a thing uh, you need to uh, always validate, and uh, if you can't validate, then uh, just toss the answers. Well, that's kind of not helping uh, when you're in situations where it's really not working. Uh, of course, you can just uh, slam your laptop shut and, and go to the beach, but if you really want internet, um, maybe you should accept this. So there, there are various ideas what we can do about this. One is um, do not allow a downgrade. Like you're, you're in a network and uh, you figure out the DNSSEC validation works, uh, then strictly require DNSSEC validation works. If someone uh, suddenly uh, starts to intercept you or actively attacks you and, and strips all the RR6, uh, just don't accept that. Uh, Unwind currently would do that. It, it will, would discover, oh, in this location, a DNSSEC is not working, so I don't bother trying. Um, but it cannot detect uh, uh, that the, you're actively being attacked, uh, so we, we need to improve on that. Uh, another thing is, since we're doing all the crypto on the laptop, we can actually trust the AD flag. So uh, bubble this up to the, uh, to the software um, who actually wants to do the resolving. Uh, that one needs to decide. So I'm doing uh, SSH my jump host, and the NSSEC validation fails then SSH should prompt me, uh, yeah, do you want to trust this? But it's not doing that. And I'm not aware of any software that actually currently does this. So it's also not very helpful. Um, uh, another thing, um, it turns out when, when you're behind um, weird captive portal, uh, sorry, weird middle boxes and uh, satellite links are one of those, that they really like to intercept and, and munch your, your UDP package. They, they, they uh, um, actually fake answers for you. Um, they don't do DNSSEC, so they, they also strip records and everything gets, gets weird at that point. However, they do not understand TCP. So if you really want to talk to the internet, uh, just uh, use a TCP. But um, uh, libunmon will not do the right thing here because it also cannot know this. Um, so it's happy to use UDP. And, um, but we know better that TCP would actually work. So the idea is that we can detect this and then uh, ha have a dedicated uh, strategy that just does TCP. Um, the... the uh, um, some, some of the captive portals you, you, you go through there and uh, they only give you internet for 30 minutes. And um, what we, so this basically means after 30 minutes you need to reconfirm. Uh, but we already know that we are past the captive portal so all the heuristics would not, would not trigger. So we need to improve on that. And one idea there is that we probably can work out what the, re the redirect domains were and uh, uh, track them, put them in a special pool to um, handle them uh, in a more special way. Uh, a thing that uh, was pointed out in the, the systemd resolve the uh, talk last year was um, that you, uh, since the captive portals are lying to you, you should really not put their answers uh, in, in the cache. And I think uh, they talked about their solution to this problem is to dump the cache afterwards uh, when, when you know that you get past the ca captive portal. But I really want to keep the cache. So I, I put my laptop to sleep all the time and I open it, so I want a hot cache. Um, so we, we need to find a better way there. And I, I hear reports of people using this behind DNS 6.4, NAT 6.4 boxes, and it kind of maybe works, but there seem to be weird problems, so I need to uh, investigate that. Anyway, uh, that was that. Do you have questions? Many questions. Thank you. Uh, in the case of the horrible airport uh, captive portal, um, you, you said the, the solution was to uh, ignore it, the NSSEC validation failures of five minutes? Yes. Does not equate, equate to a downgrade attack effectively? Yes. yes. Okay, it, it, then. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to be sure I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, yes. Because all you're doing is managing downgrade attacks in the same way. 
Yes. So the idea is, uh, so we, we, we know, know that the network changed, uh, that the kernel tells us this. Uh, you, you connect it to a new Wi-Fi. We, we treat that sp uh, special. Um, it's a trade-off. Many thanks for your presentation. I would like to ask you, uh, OpenBZ community uh, usually use uh, Comic Sans font for presentation. Why you use another one? First, I would like to thank the speaker for not using Comic Sans. <laughs> I, I will improve on that for the next time. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> Philip? Hi, Florian. Hello. Uh, well, you mentioned SSH, which yes. I find interesting because it's an application written by the same uh, project as the wor this work you're presenting. And I don't know if you're aware, but SSH does have code passed for uh, DNSSEC validation. I mean, it ships with uh, the ability to link with LDNS. That's not really worthwhile. Yeah, there are patches that also link with uh, GetDNS. That really works. Uh, but then the open the SSH maintainers seem to think that this is a complete non-problem and nobody would ever want to run it like this. So I hope that maybe your work will inspire the open SSH maintainers to, to merge uh, the NSSEC validation and then the problem should be solved for SSH at least. I, I suppose so. Um, <coughs> I think uh, the, the, um, the, the things you're talking about, these are in, in portable, uh, so I don't think that the, uh, the OpenBSD one can uh, use LDNS. Uh, it, we, we don't have that in base, so this has to be in portable. Um, well, maybe you should merge from portable then. Maybe, <laughs> yes. Uh, did you also, so I saw a list of uh, other projects, yeah. but the, uh, the project DNSSEC trigger was not on there. Because it's quite similar, I think. I can't find it on a short notice. Um, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is this still maintained? Is that still a thing? Yes. I, I came across it, and um, <laughs> it, it. Yeah, I don't re remember the specific. It, it, it looked a bit uh, abandoned, but uh, no. Okay. It's not. Okay. Sorry about that then. <coughs> Oh, several more questions. Hold on, on my way. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm curious about how much of a pain in the ass this would be to port to something other than OpenBSD. So clearly there's the pledge thing, but what else, what other OpenBSD specific things are in there that would be horrible to port? So the, the pledge thing, uh, it's, it's probably by now understood how to do that in, port in portable. Uh, other software also does that. Um, I think the, uh, the, the kernel integration uh, might be problematic uh, where um, I don't even know if this is specific to, to OpenBSD or specific to, to BSDs on how to learn that an interface came up and down and uh, these kind of things. Uh, I suppose other operating systems... Uh, um, it's not NetLink, right? No, th this is a route no. socket. Okay, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I suppose there are ways to do this, um, and uh, the, the most simple way would actually be to just use the control, the, the, the CLI, um, just uh, execute a script. So if you, if you have a way to tell, oh, uh, my, my network changed, um, pipe this through, through the CLI. I think that would be the, the easiest way. And um, other than that, I don't, I don't think there are uh, that many things that would not be portable. Right, so like IP monitor on any Linux? which just gives you stuff through a pipe. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Here's one. I was just wondering, when you said that you, uh, one of the strategies is to run your own recursor, like, for example, when you're at your office, how do you resolve printers if it suddenly doesn't trust the DACP provided forwarder? Yes. Um, where's Otto? <laughs> Otto, do you mind answering that? There's a similar question about the Firefox DOH stuff, of course, but that's not this talk. Um, well, you can uh, configure uh, uh, any name or domain and uh, uh, redirect all queries for that domain, anything under it, to a specific resolver, which is typically, let's say, a, a, a solution to your split horizon uh, thing in your office or in your home office. Um, DNSSEC can be used in that case, but also can be 
uh, switched off for those names, which in general, I think, even in our office, do not work that well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, I have time for one very quick question. So I can show this slide. This is actually the better one, I thought. <laughs> Does that good have a title? Uh. <laughs> All right, thank you for your talk. Thanks.